Welcome to the Hotchkiss Library's Reading Jubilee for 2020. We are so sorry we can't welcome you in person this year, but we hope you'll enjoy this virtual celebration of reading, literature, and libraries. Hi, I'm Eloise, I'm six, and I'm from Sharon, Connecticut. Today I'm going to be reading you a poem from Shel from Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. The name of the poem is called Peanut Butter Sandwich. I'll sing you a poem of a silly young king who played with the world at the end of a string, but he only loved one single thing, and that was just a peanut butter sandwich. His scepter and his royal gowns, his regal throne and golden crowns were brown and sticky from the mounds and drippings from each peanut butter sandwich. His subjects all were silly fool, for he had passed a royal rule that all that they could learn in school was how to make a peanut butter sandwich. He would not eat his sovereign cake. He scorned his soup and kingly cake and and told his courtly cook to bake an extra sticky peanut butter sandwich. Then one day he took a bite and started chewing with delight, but found his mouth qu was stuck quite tight from the last bite of peanut butter sandwich. The brother, his brother pulled his sister pride. The wizard pushed his mother cried. My boys committed suicide from eating his last peanut butter sandwich. The dentist came in the royal dock. The royal plumber banged and knocked, but still those jaws tightly stayed tightly locked. Oh darn, that sticky peanut butter sandwich. The carpenter, he tried with pliers. The telephone mine man tried with wires. The firemen, they tried with fire, but could not melt that peanut butter sandwich. With ropes and pulleys, drills and coil, with steaming and lubricating oil, for 20 years of tears and toil, they fought that awful peanut butter sandwich. Then all his royal subjects came. They hooked his jaws with grablin chains and pulled both ways with might and mean against that stubborn peanut butter sandwich. Each man, man, man and woman, boy and girl, put down their plows and pots and toys and pulled until crack oh joy they broke right through that peanut butter sandwich a puff of dust a screech a squeak the king's jaw opened with a creak then, and then in a voice so faint and weak the first words that he, they heard him speak were how about a peanut butter sandwich the daffodils by william wordsworth read by john champion I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never-ending line and along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Hello, my name is Jill and I'm from Sharon Congregational Church in Sharon, Connecticut. I'm not from Sharon originally though, I'm from Northern Ireland. And my husband, Bob, is the pastor of the church. I'd like to read an extract from a book that is very special to me and that I know has helped lots of people during this pandemic. The book is called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse. I'm so small, said the mole. Yes, said the boy, 
but you make a huge difference. What do you want to be when you grow up? Kind, said the boy. What do you think success is? asked the boy. To love, said the mole. Well, hello. Do you have a favourite saying? asked the boy. Yes, said the mole. What is it? If at first you don't succeed, have some cake. I see. Does it work? Every time. Just a tiny taste. I got you a delicious cake, said the mole. Did you? Yes. Where is it? I ate it, said the mole. Oh, but I got you another. Did you? Where is that one? The same thing seems to have happened. Thank you for listening. I'm Tom Trowbridge. Uh, my last haircut was on January 28. Um, how about some Ogden Nash? This one's called A Flea and a Fly in a Flu. A flea and a fly in a flu. We're imprisoned, so what could they do? Said the fly, let us flee. Said the flea, let us fly. So they flew through a flaw in the flu. Here's one he called, I have no idea why, lather as you go. Beneath this slab, John Brown is stowed. He watched the ads and not the road. Uh, Nash wrote a lot of uh, poems about uh, animals. Here's one called The Cow. The cow is of the bovine ilk. One end is moo, the other milk. Finally, here's some advice to husbands. To keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup, whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. Over and out. An excerpt from Chapter 4 of Winnie the Pooh by A. A. Milne, in which Eeyore loses a tail and Pooh finds one. The old gray donkey Eeyore stood by himself in a thistly corner of the forest, his front feet well apart, his head on one side, and thought about things. Sometimes he thought sadly to himself, why? And sometimes he thought, wherefore? And sometimes he thought, inasmuch as which? And sometimes he didn't know quite what he was thinking about. So when Winnie the Pooh came stumping along, Eeyore was very glad to be able to stop thinking for a little in order to say, how do you do, in a gloomy manner to him. And how are you, said Winnie the Pooh. Eeyore shook his head from side to side. Not very how, he said. I don't seem to have felt at all how for a long time. Dear, dear, said Pooh, I'm sorry about that. Let's have a look at you. So Eeyore stood there, gazing sadly at the ground, and Winnie the Pooh walked all around him once. Why, what's happened to your tail? he said in surprise. What has happened to it? said Eeyore. Isn't it there? Are you sure? Well, either a tail is there or it isn't there. You can't make a mistake about it. And yours isn't there. Then what is? Nothing. Let's have a look, said Eeyore and he turned slowly round to the place where his tail had been a little while ago, and then finding that he couldn't catch it up, he turned round the other way until he came back to where he was at first, and then he put his head down and looked between his front legs, and at last he said with a long, sad sigh, I believe you're right. Of course I'm right, said Pooh. That accounts for a great deal, said Eeyore gloomily. It explains everything.
No wonder. You must have left it somewhere, said Winnie the Pooh. Somebody must have taken it, said Eeyore. How like them, he added after a long silence. Pooh felt he ought to say something helpful about it, but he didn't know what, so he decided to do something helpful instead. Eeyore, he said solemnly, I, Winnie the Pooh, will find your tail for you. Thank you, Pooh, answered Eeyore. You're a real friend, he said, not like some. So Winnie the Pooh went off to find Eeyore's tail. Hi, I'm Dale Jones and I'm a selectman here in Sharon. And since radio is my career and songwriters are poets and with Mother's Day coming, I'm reading Taylor Swift's homage to her mom. It's called The Best Day. I'm five years old. It's getting cold. I've got my big coat on. I hear you laugh. I look up smiling at you. I run and run past the pumpkin patch and the tractor rides. Look now, the sky is gold. I hug your legs and fall asleep on the way home. I don't know why all the trees change in the fall, but I know you're not scared of anything at all. Don't know if Snow White's house is near or far away, but I know I had the best day with you today. I'm 13 now and don't know how my friends could be so mean. I come home crying and you hold me tight and grab the keys and we drive and drive until we find a town far enough away and we talk in window shop till I've forgotten their names. I don't know who I'm going to talk to now at school, but I know I'm laughing on the car ride home with you. Don't know how long it's going to take to feel okay, but I know I had the best day with you today. I have an excellent father. His strength is making me stronger. God smiles on my little brother. Inside and out, he's better than I am. I grew up in a pretty house, and I've got space to run and hide, and I had the best days with you. There's a video I found from back when I was three. You set up a paint set in the kitchen. You're talking to me. It's the age of princesses and pirate ships and the seven dwarves. And Daddy's smart, and you're the prettiest lady in the whole wide world. And I now know why all the trees change in the fall. I know you were on my side even when I was wrong. And I love you for giving me your eyes, staying back, and watching me shine. And I didn't know if you knew, so I'm taking this chance to say that I had the best day with you today. And a happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Art Making Poem by Tara Moore. Your gifts are shy and stand behind you like a child peeking out from mommy's leg. But you already know that. You've seen it a thousand times as you've tucked and buried them, wondering what was wrong with you. It wasn't you. Gifts are bashful. Most lie hidden and die in alleys or crumble into broken stones. What to do? How to entice them to open the sliding door and step out? A mad love for the thing itself is the best remedy that's been discovered. A love so wild, you're willing to step into the middle of a circle and dance. You won't know if the witnesses around you are the neighbors or the world or just critics from within, but you'll go there for the feeling of your foot sanding the floor, for the flight in your chest when you jump. That's the best prescription. A kind of foolery. A mad love. But what if the fear has won out, you ask? First, sink down to the floor and kiss your feet. Fall like someone who's just popped the balloon of you. Then hug yourself into stillness. Know that, sweetie, it will be all right. Next, build a fort in your bedroom, a soft and covered space. Pitch blankets, prop pillows, bring a firefly inside for light. Then take it out, whatever it is, your flute, your pen, your clay, and say your prayer of thank you. For this everything, vessel for your thoughts, ceaseless companion, adventure bringer, peace song. Then take the question, is it good or not, and send it to the river to fish. Let it catch your dinner while you work. You're not making to be good. You're making because it is the great romance of your life. Then make something, a little thing. Look at how it loves you, how it woke up the earth to you and gave you a life heart back. How the days are growing long again, as in childhood, as if time is being given back to you as you learn how your soul wants to fill it. This is The Owl and the Pussycat by, uh, by Edward Lear. Um, probably most of you know it. The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey 
and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up at the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for a ring, a ring? What shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood, a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced to the light of the moon, the moon. They danced to the light of the moon. That's the owl and the pussycat. Now this is another one. It's called Credo by Sue Norris. From drought a desert's undulating dunes, wetlands and flowers from monsoons. Whatever raw materials are at hand, nature makes us something grand. So too may I find a way to wring meaning from an arid day. And whatever weather comes along, learn to compose a satisfying song. My name is Bob Maxwell, and I'm going to read a poem by Paul Tran called Copernicus. Who doesn't know how doubt lifts the hem of his nightgown to reveal another inch of thigh before the face of faith? I once didn't. I once thought I was my own geometry, my own geocentric planet, spinning like a ballerina alone at the center of the universe at the command of a god. Opening my music box with his dirty mouth, he said, let there be light, and I thought I was the light. I was a man's failed imagination. Now I know what appears as the motion of heaven is just the motion of earth. Not stars, not whatever I want. And now it's time for novel writing, which today comes from the West Country on Dorset. Hello and welcome to novel writing, where... A very good crowd has turned out to watch local boy Thomas Hardy write his new novel on this very pleasant July morning. Here comes Hardy walking out towards his desk. He looks confident, relaxed. He looks very much the man in form as he acknowledges this very good-natured bank holiday crowd. The crowd goes quiet as Hardy settles himself down at the desk, pen held lightly but firmly in the right hand, and he's off. It's the first word, but it's not a word. Oh, no, it's a doodle, a piece of meaningless scribble, and he signs his name underneath it. Oh, dear, what a disappointing start, but he's off again. And here he goes. The first word of Thomas Hardy's new novel is three letters. It's a definite article, and it's the. Well, this is true to form. He started five of his 11 novels today with a definite article. Two it's, one but, two ats, one on, and a Dolores. But that, of course, was never published. I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but he's crossed it out. Thomas Hardy, here on the first day of his new novel, has crossed out the only word he has written so far, and he's gazing off to space. Oh, oh dear. There he signed his name again. But he's now he's down again in writing. Dennis, he has written A, and there's a second word coming. And it's sat. A sat doesn't make sense. A satter. It's a Saturday. And the crowd are loving it. And it's afternoon. It's Saturday afternoon in, in, in November. November is spelled wrong, but he's left out. The, he's left out at the second D, but he's not going back. Now the first verb is coming up. It's the first verb of the novel, and it's was. And the crowd are, and the crowd is going wild. Hardy's just completed his first sentence. It's a real cracker. Just listen to this. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching the time of twilight, and a vast tract of unenclosed wild known as Egdon Heath embrowned himself moment by moment, and that after only three hours of writing. What a cracker! My name is Bob Kay, and I'm the pastor of Sharon Congregational Church. I'd like to read a poem by Emily Dickinson for you today. I think it's appropriate during these days of social distancing. Before I read the poem, I just want to mention two hints. First, 
The word bobolink refers to a songbird, and the word surplus refers to clerical garments. Here's the poem. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home with a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. And instead of tolling the bells for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of going to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Now this poem might have seemed irreverent to people in her day, but I don't think that Jesus would have felt that way. After all, Jesus was the one who said, consider the lilies of the field. Not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like these. And also the poets of the Old Testament. For example, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earth displays his handiwork. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they teach us. Their voice is heard around the globe. Their words run to the ends of the earth. Thank you. I hope you enjoy these poems. Bye. Hi, it's Mrs. Pace from the Sharon Center School Library, and I am sharing one of my favorite Shel Silverstein poems, Listen to the Mustn'ts. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never-haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. This is a poem from one of my favorite collections. It's a book called She Walks in Beauty, edited by Caroline Kennedy, and has collected some of her favorite poems and her mother's, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. The one I've chosen is actually written by Ralph Waldo Emerson and is a letter to, from a letter to his daughter. And she says, Finish every day and be done with it. You've done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in, but forget them just as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Begin it well and serenely, and with too high a spirit to be encumbered with your old nonsense. This day is all that is good and fair, and it's too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on yesterday. Hi, I'm Samantha, and this is Rowan, and today we're going to read The Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Mm -hmm. Jabberwocky. Twas brilliant in and the slithy toves did cry and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogroves, and the mome rats outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumerous bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxum foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tolgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with his head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, Kaloo, Kalei! He chortled in his joy. 
Twas brilliant and the slithy toes did gear and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borer groves and the mome rats outgrave. I think I know. I'm reading from Eunice Trowbridge's book, Music from a Farther Room, published in 1990. I had attended Bennington College for three years before my marriage. After my children were grown, I returned to school. College courses offered more excitement than house cleaning, volunteer work, the music club, and watercolor lessons. Studying art history seemed more challenging than talking with Michelangelo. Studying offered tangible rewards, and I wasn't the only one to benefit from my courses. After only six weeks of freshman English, my daughter noticed a change in me. Your letters are much more detailed and amusing to read now, she wrote me. I also recall my oldest son during his junior year in college joking about the incongruity of a roommate's remark that on the weekend he'd be attending his mother's wedding. I reminded my son that before long he'd be making a statement that would sound even more bizarre. I'm going to my mother's graduation. That wasn't my last graduation either. I went on for a master's degree in English. Along the way, I accepted a graduate assistantship and caught my first glimpse of teaching something I might do. I began to learn about the joys and the frustrations that any instructor experiences. As I read and commented on student papers that ranged from chaotic thoughts carelessly scrawled to perceived ideas carefully ordered. I had acquired a momentum by then, so when I received my MA the day after my middle son's college graduation, I couldn't imagine halting my efforts. The idea of the PhD program was too formidable and it seemed high time to pay my way, so I applied for a part-time teaching position at the university. Within a year, I was standing on the other side of the desk and I was giving assignments. Teaching even part-time allows me to meet a greater cross-section of people than ever before, and I come to know them far more personally. I have known them all, from the affluent student who drives his Porsche to New Jersey each weekend to the mother of seven who works as a telephone operator to finance her tuition. She says she's worked and saved for five years, determined to go to college when her older children enroll. She's finding the experience more richly absorbing than she had imagined possible, she tells me. And I understand perfectly. This is from My Antonia by Willa Cather. Last summer, I happened to be crossing the plains of Iowa in a season of intense heat, and it was my good fortune to have for a traveling companion James Quail Burden, Jim Burden, as we still call him in the West. He and I are old friends. We grew up together in the same Nebraska town, and we had much to say to each other. While the train flashed through never-ending miles of ripe wheat by country towns and bright-flowered pastures and oak groves wilting in the sun, we sat in the observation car, where the woodwork was hot to the touch, and red dust lay deep over everything. The dust and heat, the burning wind, reminded us of many things. We were talking about what it is like to spend one's childhood in little towns like these, buried in wheat and corn, under stimulating extremes of climate, burning summers when the world lies green and billowy beneath a brilliant sky, when one is fairly stifled in vegetation, in the color and smell of strong weeds and heavy harvests, blustery winters with little snow, when the whole country is stripped bare and gray as sheet iron. We agreed that no one who had not grown up in a little prairie town could know anything about it. It was a kind of Freemasonry, we said, Although Jim Burden and I both live in New York, we are old friends. I do not see much of him there. He is legal counsel for one of the great Western railways and is sometimes away from his New York office for weeks together. That is one reason why we do not often meet. Another is that I do not like his wife. During that burning day when we were crossing Iowa, our talk kept returning to a central figure a bohemian girl whom we had known long ago and whom both of us admired. More than any other person we remembered, this girl seemed to mean to us the country, the conditions, the whole adventure of our childhood. To speak her name was to call up pictures of people and places, 
to set a quiet drama going in one's brain. I had lost sight of her altogether, but Jim had found her again after long years, had renewed a friendship that meant a great deal to him, and out of his busy life had set apart time enough to enjoy that friendship. His mind was full of her that day. He made me see her again, feel her presence, revived all my old affection for her. My own story was never written, but the following narrative is Jim's manuscript, substantially as he brought it to me. The Drink by Ron Padgett. I am always interested in the people in films who have just had a drink thrown in their faces. Sometimes they react with uncontrollable rage, but sometimes, my favorites, they do not change their expressions at all. Instead, they raise a handkerchief or a napkin and calmly dab at the offending liquid as the hurler jumps to her feet and storms away. The other people at the table are understandably uncomfortable. A woman leans over and places her hand on the sleeve of the man's jacket and says, David, you know she didn't mean it. David answers, yes, but in an ambiguous tone, the perfect adult response. But now the orchestra has resumed its amiable and lively dance music, and the room is set in motion as before. Out in the parking lot, however, Elizabeth is setting fire to David's car. Yes, this is a contemporary film. On the faraway island of Salamasan, Jurdo the turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need. They were all happy. Quite happy, indeed. They were until Jurdo, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Jurdo. Of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on the pond, but I cannot see places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king, what a ruler of all that I see. So Yurdle the Turtle King lifted his hand, and Yurdle the Turtle King gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on one another's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yurdo climbed up, he sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view, he could see most a mile. All mine, cried Yurdo. Of all the things that I rule, I'm the king of the cow, I'm the king of the mule, I'm the king of a house, and what's more, beyond that, I'm the king of the blueberry bush and the cat. I'm Yurdo the turtle, oh marvelous me, for I am ruler of all that I see. And all through the morning he sat up there high, saying over and over, a great king am I, until long about noon. Then he heard a faint sigh. What's that? snapped the king. And he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac, just a part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up, and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yurtle. I've pains in my back, and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence! The king of the turtles barked back. I am king, and you are only a turtle named Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of the cow, I'm king of the mule, I'm king of the house, I'm king of the bush and cat, and much more than that, I'll be better than that. My throne shall be higher, his royal voice thundered. So pile more turtles, I want about 200. Turtles, more turtles! He bellowed and prayed, and the turtles weighed down in the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, they all came, they obeyed. From all over the pond, they came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins. And all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yurtle the turtle was perched up so high, he could see 40 miles from the throne in the sky. Hooray! shouted Yurtle. I'm the king of the trees. I'm the king of the birds. I'm the king of the bees. I'm the king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah, me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I am Yurtle the turtle, oh marvelous me, for I am ruler of all that I see. Then again from far below, in a great heavy stack, came the groan of the pain from that turtle named Mac. Your Majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below we are feeling great pain. I know up on top you are seeing great sights, but down here at the bottom we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it, our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food, we are starving, groaned Mac. 
You hush up your mouth, howl the mighty King Yurdle. You've no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I rule from the clouds, over land, over sea. There's nothing, no, nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening had started to rise up over his head in what the darkening sky. What's that? snorted Yurdle. Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yurdle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can. I will. I'll call some more turtles. Stack them to heaven. I need about 5,607. But as Yurdle the Turtle King lifted his hand, he started to order and give a command. That plain little turtle below on the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a bit mad. And that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. He burped, and his burp shook the throne of the king. <laughs> and Yurdle the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air and the birds and the bees, the king of the house and a cow and the mule. Well, that was the end of the turtle king's rule. For Yurdle the king of all of Salamasond fell off his high throne and went plunk into the pond. Today the great turtle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud. That is all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free. As, As turtles, turtles and maybe all creatures should be. Surfboard, surfboard, zooming through the waves. Having fun like crazy, when it's low tide, comfortable, 